Hello and welcome to this week's uh, Books Crypto Club catch up over Zoom. It's Sunday the 11th of April um, and we've got our informal weekly chats where we talk about whatever, whether it be DeFi, NFTs, cryptocurrency, blockchains, we, we never really know. So hopefully you'll find this of interest and as the YouTubers always say, you know, click on that subscribe button, click the like, do whatever YouTubers do, make a comment and enjoy. Chris. Hello. Good Gary. Good afternoon to you. Oh, you've gone back to school. <laughs> I'm all, always at school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Um, yeah, it looks as though you've got a, <clears throat> a fair class turning up tonight. Mm, yeah, hopefully. We'll, we'll, we'll see if anyone actually shows up or not. It's always an adventure with this kind of thing. Uh, well, it's... It, it's quite difficult, isn't it, at this time of the evening at a weekend with the sun, the days getting longer. Yep. No. So, and it's, it's actually nice looking outside and seeing it's actually sunny and quite nice. Yes. Well, it's actually quite cold out there at the moment. Yeah. It, well, it is. Once the sun goes in, the wind's still very cold. Yep. No, absolutely. So you've been watching what's happening in the crypto world this week? It's been very interesting. I mean, I think, uh, I think crypto is holding up extremely well. And... Um, uh, to me, the signals are getting stronger all the time that it's becoming more and more acceptable. Yeah, it was really interesting this week. There was the announcements by HSBC Bank that they were, I, th I think they're withdrawing their accounts. Uh, oh, sorry, the ability to trade in MicroStrategy shares or, or something. Because my, MicroStrategy was one of the first big companies to announce it was actually going to hold Bitcoin as part of its treasury reserves. Um, and so it was interesting that I think it was HSBC this week said, well, we're, with, we're not gonna get involved in that. So you, you can't deal with them, which is quite bizarre. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we shall see anyway. I, uh, I think that there's more and more acceptance that there has to be um, a source of value somewhere. And um, it, yes, of course, it, Bitcoin could blow up tomorrow. Um, but I, I think now it's got to the point where it is well enough established to be a store of value, irrespective yeah. of how difficult or easy it is to use. Well, you got this whole thing. I mean, this is why it's interesting with it being different cryptocurrencies. So you know, Bitcoin certainly seems to be getting used as a store of value, but that was not its original purpose. It was mean, no. meant to be a means of exchange. <laughs> but Bitcoin Cash and Litecoin are great you know means of exchange because they've got low transaction fees and that and there'll, there'll be other cryptocurrencies coming out as well that do these things so yeah i, I think it's all getting very exciting at the moment yes i mean it, it, i think bitcoin always will be the value side and but the, the uh, of course it's the blockchain that's actually the driving force behind all of this yeah yeah and, and that's the thing it's worth thing a lot of people still keep forgetting that and they're all just focusing on prices going up or down or whatever. But it's actually how the underlying technology is improving. I, yeah. I, keep, I keep describing it. It's a little bit like uh, the gold rush in California, where you know, there was this sudden fervor. Everyone piled into California to go uh, gold prospecting. Yeah. And then eventually it all collapsed, which is what, you know, we'll, we'll go through phases of that with crypto. But even after the collapse, it still left the railroads in place, the towns, the infrastructure, yep. which then was what built on and they developed things from that. And, and, and the value of gold remained. So uh, yeah. the fact that that particular source of it ran out. Yep. Is, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I'm still very interested in the Internet of Things and G5 um, and, and where IOTA will come in all that. Um, yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting. There's a few people who are watching quite closely on IOTA. Um, and as you say, with things like 5G. So I think I've mentioned a couple of times, there's um, kind of a, what, what describes an IOT company, although they're really a, a, originally a barcoding and device scanning company uh, called Zebra Telecom, or sorry, uh, Zebra Technologies. And they have done a project uh, with IOTA so I think it's hooking their devices and hooking the IOTA tangle uh, together because IOTA is technically not a blockchain. It, it's, yeah. it's, what, it's what known as a, a DAG. And I, yeah. I can never remember the letters stand for. It's like 
decentralized acrylic graph or something, but it's a, di a different way of holding data. Um, and it looks like they're using that to track and trace data coming out of IoT devices. Well, it, it seems that the, the, it, it's the sole uh, source at the moment of enough speed and power to uh, drive self-drive cars and and manage all the information that's coming in at, a, at the speed that uh, G5 will inevitably have to operate. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was on a call a couple of weeks ago with um, a, a developer stroke engineer uh, for Siemens. So yes. Siemens, big manufacturing company, uh, and they're doing a lot of stuff right now around IoT and AI uh, for railway management. So they, they got stuff, I was taking a look at a couple of the projects, where at the actual railway station, they've got loads of CCTV cameras that are tracking the movement of passengers. And they're using AI to analyze not just passenger flow, but things like unusual behavior. Like, you know, is that passenger lying down to have a rest or have they fallen over because they need medical attention? Uh, and it calls someone yeah. out and that kind of thing. Or, you know, is it someone who's about to jump onto the track? So they're, they're doing some really interesting stuff with edge computing. Um, yeah, I, think, I think they're doing that at airports as well. There's, all, not... there's all sorts like this, yeah. 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 But, but Siemens I found really interesting because the, the guy shared with me a couple of the projects where they got it both at the railway station doing this kind of thing and also uh, in the cab of the train and so it's actually filming as the train goes along the track and it's spotting when there might be any objects on the track way faster yeah. than a human can do it. So the, the idea being, you know, if there's um, a, a tree falls on the track or there's leaves or whatever, then the train can automatically slow down in that. But, and it's all around autonomous operation. So, yeah, they're, they're doing some fantastic stuff. Their website, I think, has actually got a couple of videos you can look at now as well. I think it's gone public. Um, yeah. Where, yeah, you look at what they're doing. And then you start linking it in again with things like blockchain, distributed ledger, where you're then keeping an entire immutable record of what was going on and how it worked and everything. It's fascinating stuff. Yeah. yeah. Where do you think that the, the, the release about the information for Ripple and, uh, well, I suppose you... you it's not just Ripple, I suppose Stellar is coming up on the back of that as well. Uh, well, the, they've done, was it the due disclosure or something notice with the SEC? Yeah, well, I haven't uh, actually seen what it was. I, I, I think, I, I, I skimmed over it very quickly, or, or what it was, and someone else may come on the call soon who can help with this. But I think it's simply that they managed to get the SEC to release the justification as to why they didn't consider Bitcoin and Ethereum to be securities. And so I think they're going to try and use the arguments if they can, if they can work out why the SEC said Bitcoin and Ethereum aren't securities, they'll see if they can use the same arguments for why Ripple isn't. Um, so I, th I think it's quite an interesting thing that it's just a, the, the American legal system goes through a lot of discovery where they do a lot of discovery processes to see where decisions have been made and how they've been made. And then they then use that to either show precedence or uh, to give them some useful background on some angles they can take. Yeah. So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see where it goes. But and how's your work on the uh, non-fungibles going? It, it's fascinating. Some of the conversations I'm having um, are really, really interesting. So I'm, I'm working on a project at the moment which is uh, an art gallery yeah. who they, they, they deal in <laughs> traditional artwork. So, you know, kind of like the, the Sotheby's Christie's type of stuff, where it's traditional art, a particular genre, uh, and they're looking at having an NFT option with it. So we'll probably do that as effectively a certificate of ownership. Yes. So it'll, it'll just be the novelty of it really, which is quite interesting, but they're looking at then developing that further uh, so that, that's really interesting. But some of the other conversations I've been having as well um, around things like um, 3D videoing of events. So say a music concert or something, but you do a 3D video of it with holograms. You NFT that experience 
and you make it available through a VR headset. So you've got virtuality headset on where it actually feels as though you are part of the concert or part of the band playing yeah. music and that kind of thing. And they're looking at doing NFT and NFT around that. And then and, there's a little... And have they sort of how they can monetize that? Well, this is the whole thing that what it means is that they'll be able to sell that to fans. Yeah. And a, bit, a bit like how you go to a music concert now and, you know, you might hold a concert ticket afterwards to show that you went to, you know, that amazing concert in 1997 or whatever. Well, this time you'll have a <laughs> token that proves that you've got that and will also grant you access to reenact the event again. So, and if you if you handed that on to a friend, that could of course be tracked, and therefore you'd have to pay again, even though your friend was the one watching it. Yeah, and so this is why the, the arts um, sector is getting interested in this. Is one of the problems with art is you know you, you go and do a lovely painting, you get paid a million pounds for it, and then it gets sold on for five million, sold on for ten million, sold on for twenty million, but you never see any more of it. You no. only ever see your original payments. Um, whereas with an NFT, you can do it that every time it's then sold on, you get a 10% effect, a license, a, a license payment. So that's really interesting from the digital art point of view. What's even more interesting is when you do that for things like music, where music at the moment, um, the license revenue and payment model is very complicated. So if you've got four people in a band and a producer, and whatever, every time that music is played on the radio, you receive a royalty, and then you have to divide that royalty up in certain proportions, and it goes all sorts of things. Um, and if it's played on internet radio instead of terrestrial radio, there's different rates. Uh, it all gets really complex. Well, with NFTs, you could do that irrespective of the mechanism that's used. It would automatically make the payments. So that makes it transformational in the music industry. So there's one DJ who is now live. He did an NFT of some work he did. There's another DJ who is making an announcement in the next few weeks at a big conference that he's effectively NFTing his um, DJ music mixing experience. So I think music's going to be the next big area. And then the one after, and then the one after that is probably going to be things like video. Um, particularly things like sports events. So the ability to not only watch your favourite football team score their favourite goal, but be able to reenact it, have an AI overlay showing where the shot was and who took it, um, and then have an NFT to show that you're the original owner of that one reproduced event. So, yeah, yeah I mean, I, mean I, I, a lot, a lot of people don't understand what the point of NFTs are, you know, they're just silly and everything. I say, look, I don't see the point of pa pa paying to watch a football match, but people do. Um, and football fans in particular are very loyal to their teams and that they'll spend loads of money on like t-shirts and all this kind of stuff. So if you can do it whereby they replay an event that they were at or was a crucial point in a game and they've now got something to show that they effectively own the rights to that moment in that theme's history. Fascinating stuff. Yeah. See, see where it goes. <laughs> yes, yeah, be interesting. We ought to... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've got on intros into a, a, some of the top songwriters, and um, I'm just wondering whether we can't get some sort of consultancy thing going for them. Well, it, it's happened before, but the, the music industry has been through this once already. So um, the girl whose name I can never remember, in, Imogen Heap, who's yeah. a music, musician, she, she's already done this. They did it on, I think it was Mycelium Project, uh, doing exactly this kind of thing. And she, she, she's got one of her songs is on the blockchain. Um, yes. Yeah, she actually um, put... Uh, a hashed version of it on there, I think it was. Um, so they're already looking at this. So yeah, anytime, if you know any musicians are thinking of going into this space, maybe we could set something up and at least have the conversation to explore it yeah. or, to, or to explain it to them. I, I, well, it, 
it, it, it must be um, an avenue worth pursuing because if, if a song, instead of having to sell your songbook, if you put the whole thing into an NFT, effectively, uh, you have the rights to it forever. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you can do even cleverer things, like you could have each song is an NFT. Yeah. But, but the compilation of those songs is um, an NFT, which is the album. So you, you have it kind of layered. Or you could have the rights, the music playing in a game in some way being NFT. So there's all sorts of stuff. And I, I think we're just at the stage now where I think people are just beginning to have some really interesting ideas. And most of them will fall away. Most of them will fail. But a few of them are going to be the ones where you go, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. And, and they'll explore it. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, but I was on a call a couple of days ago, TV channel in the States who are doing a, um, an, an internet TV um, interview around NFTs and that. And what, one of the guys who was on the call with me that uh, are a, an Ethereum blockchain consultancy stroke development shop. And they were talking about having these tokens and linking them together and reselling them and that. So yeah, well, the, the, the problem with that is um, if you've got an NFT as it is now, it's not regulated. So that's great. You don't have to worry about financial regulation and that. As soon as you start having something on top of an NFT, so, you know, like a pool of NFTs or um, a collection yeah. of them, that then becomes in some jurisdictions known as a derivative. And a, and a, yeah. financial, a financial derivative is regulated. Yes. And, that, and this is the really crazy thing. It, you know, even though Bitcoin, for example, Bitcoin's cryptocurrency, so in the UK, crypto is not regulated. If you put a wrapper around Bitcoin, so you don't actually own Bitcoin, but you own um, a pool of it or something, that is a regulated instrument. And so it means you have to oblige by all sorts of FCA requirements. And so I think what we're going to see is some companies are just going to go ahead because they're tech geeks or whatever. And they're going to go, oh, yeah, we'll get this token and we'll glue it to this token and we'll rebrand it and resell it or whatever, without realizing that suddenly uh, they're breaking various regulatory rules in the US and the UK in particular. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. But it doesn't stop them. Usually what happens is they go off naive <laughs> doing this. And if it doesn't turn into anything big, then no one's really bothered. But if it does explode, which is what's happened with Ripple, yeah. um, then the regulator suddenly goes, oh, hang on. You know, when we looked at that originally, it was only, you know, a million dollars or whatever. Now it's hundreds of millions of dollars. They, they get quite nervous. And it's typically they get nervous about um, people putting in money into these schemes, then losing all the money. Uh, and regulators don't like um, consumers losing money um, for, for scams and that, because when that happens, then the government comes in and the lawyers come in and it doesn't end well uh, no so we'll, we'll see where that goes anyway. no, I, I know we're not into financial advice but it, it strikes me that the government's going to start clawing money wherever it can um, yep. uh, capital gains tax is one of the issues that is going to become uh, when i've never minded paying tax on profits Mm -hmm. I've, I've always felt that's perfectly reasonable. But it strikes me that since one has a capital gains tax allowance, there's almost an avenue to sell up to your allowance every year and then buy straight back. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is that there, there are schemes that do things like that. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's quite bizarre, isn't it? That it, you've got a threshold each year. It's like your personal allowance. Yeah. Um, and if you don't use it, you kind of lose it. <clears throat> well, how could you do it in a way that actually you do use it each year would be quite an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, I, again, this is where the, the government's really interested in cryptocurrency and developments because it allows them potentially to automate taxation. Yeah. So they, they kind of like it in that respect. Um but they get a little bit more nervous if people are trying to use it as a way of avoiding paying taxes. Uh, so, 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's been, it's interesting. You look at um, CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, there's a lot of research going on to them at the moment. Um, yeah. And again, government, government seem quite interested with the idea that even though it's not a cryptocurrency, it's a digital currency. And because of that, it would be trackable. And governments always like to track what their citizens are doing for some reason, uh, each to their own. Um, but they also like the idea that they could automate tax payments through it. So you think about it. Well, but of course, it becomes much easier for them if, if they get rid of cash. And, and that's yep. been accelerated dramatically in the last six months. Well, but, ever since COVID came along, really. But, but that's, that's right. It, it, was, it was shrinking. That the use of cash in the UK, I've forgotten the numbers, but it was shrinking quite significantly each year anyway. And then COVID has really caused it to explode. And, and you know, um, less and less cash being used now. I mean, I, it's very rare I use cash for anything. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's more the case. So, yeah, so good. The, the but of course that, it then... It then allows both the banks and the government to have a con much more control over and record over what you're actually doing with your cash. Yeah, and, and that, that, therein lies the two problems. What, one is the fact that um, it's visible what you're doing. And at the end of the day, it's like, well, does that matter? If you're not doing anything illegal, do, does it matter if you, you can see? But as they always say, well, you're not doing anything illegal at home, but you still have curtains on your windows because you want some privacy. So you've got a right to be able to do these things privately, um, which is one thing. The more concerning thing about digital cash, though, is the way that you can actually control it yeah. as to whether people can use it or not. So China is the great example right now with um, DCEP, which is the Chinese um, digital currency that's being rolled out because it looks like that'll have the ability for you to hold um, the, the digital cash in a, like a mobile phone, like a wallet, but the government could potentially switch that off. So if they decide that you're doing something that is going against the party line, then all of a sudden your access to your own bank accounts disappeared. Yeah. Um, and that, that, that actually seems worse than having the, it being traced in the first place. But yeah, the, Interesting. But there's a, you know, there, there must be such a huge black economy just within something like eBay. I mean, how, how many people are declaring what they're doing on eBay? eBay, I presume, has to report to the government. That... Yeah. Well, m most of them do, I think, um, in terms of traditional currencies, or they either have to report, or certainly there is an obligation that if the government makes a request, they have to provide the detail. I know that's certainly the case with HMRC for taxation, um, that if they make a request to get hold of people's uh, financial details, there's yeah. in, in the UK at least an obligation to assist them. So yeah, it's, um, so it's one of those things that in some ways it, it could be good because the good thing about digital cash is that it's cheaper to handle. You know, you, you, don't, have, you don't have to print it, you don't have to pay people to stick it in tills and count it and all this kind of thing. And it was really interesting the other, the other week, I was on um, an interview on the Money Magpie series. Catherine so Bertles, who runs Money Magpie, she's doing a, a series at the moment. She's interviewing various people. And she and I uh, did a recording about dig digital cash and cryptocurrency and various stuff. Uh, and it was me... And the guy who's a foreign exchange dealer who um, that deals with your, you know, you, you come home from abroad and you've got some cash yeah. in wherever, <clears throat> he converts in that. And then there was a guy who's the um, finance editor for the Mail on Sunday. And we, we're talking this stuff through. Um, and we went through the whole, you know, digital cash is eroding away and this kind of thing. Um, but you can see how it is that there may be a time where it is all digital because it's just easy to deal with. And what was really surprising, though, was they, they interviewed a load of people on the streets. I think it was in London they did it. They just interviewed people about what they thought about digital cash. And it's fascinating. One of the guys said, oh, I, I prefer it digital because then I can look at my 
you know, on my phone, I've got my bank account or whatever, and I can see it going up and down. And it's kind of, I was fascinated because I always thought that the idea of cash, you know, as a child playing with a piggy bank and this kind of thing, was that you got to see the value of adding it up and saving it and spending it in there. But no, younger people now are saying they prefer it online because they can see the graphs of their savings going up or down or whatever. So, yeah. I wonder how that works in a society where uh, if you want something, you have it because you just borrow the money and you don't have to have the, the resource. Well, th that's where you almost go down the whole scary thought about UBI or uh, universal basic income. That if society completely collapsed and no one had any jobs, they still need a way of being fed. And so maybe a way of doing that is you give everyone a, a, an allowance, which goes into their bank account, and they spend it in whatever, where all of a sudden that means there's no incentive to work, which yeah. you know, it, it ne is never very popular with those who are working. Um, <laughs> but yeah, th there's all sorts of things that could happen in this way. Um, and it, it seems there's more and more of these things coming up faster and faster. And again, COVID seems to be accelerating the thinking around some of this um, because I can't even remember, UK is, was it three, three and a half million unemployed at the moment? I, yeah. suspect, I <clears throat> suspect that's going to rock it pretty soon um, you know, because the, yeah. the, the, they're, they're trying to reopen the economy. But meanwhile, there's going to be firms that are just going to go bust because they just couldn't survive for long enough. You've got the whole thing about the business loans. Um, at some point, they're going to have to be repaid. And for a lot of companies, it's going to be financially more convenient to liquidate the company, let it go out of business. So you don't have to pay back the loan. Yeah. You make everyone redundant, and then you start another business. Um, yes, there are a lot of zombie companies out there, sadly. Yeah. And, and we have them too. Yeah, and it's awful. But you know, if you're a business person and you're going to have to pay back a £100,000 loan or you can liquidate your company, let that amount get written off because the government's underwriting it anyway, and then start another company, yeah. you know, that must be quite tempting for some people, um, even though that is going to have a far worse effect on the economy. So see where it goes. Well, one of the benefits of crowdfunding and... and uh... IPOs or whatever they do through uh, digital is, is that, that that allows money to go to small entrepreneurial businesses. Mm -hmm. The banks have been piling money into zombie companies to keep them afloat um, at, at the expense of potentially viable young businesses. Yeah. yeah. So maybe it, it'll all pan out well in the end. We'll lose some of the big companies and there'll be a lot of crying going on but we only need the, the the entrepreneurial spirit in this country the average bloke to employ two or three people and we don't have an employment problem yeah yeah I, I, that's kind of the hope but I, I i do think that they've probably misjudged things at the moment because the whole thing about the business loans is that it means that quite a few people have taken out the loans simply get to get the money that they know quite well that their company is going to fold. They know yeah. that they're not going to have to pay the loan back and the bank doesn't care that they're not going to pay the loan back because the bank's got a guaranteed return from the government. Yeah. They'll print a bit more. Exactly. Yeah. So it's so all that means is they're going to print more and tax more. Well, the, the trouble is they can't raise interest rates because that would cripple the government. Yep. Um, and it, it's useless for people like me with savings and retirement income. Um, that's, although they say it, the millennials and the baby boomers are the people who are benefiting, actually, for the vast majority of them who are middle class, they don't have big pension pots. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they, they have savings that they've, well, I suppose in the same way when we were talking about the use of loans. I mean, when I was growing up, you didn't have that access. If you wanted something, you had to save up for it. And by the time you'd saved up, you probably didn't want it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and that was the thing. I, I think that was what... The, the, there's been two major things that have led to complete collapse of the economy. Um, 
One was the removal from the gold standard of money. So there was no longer something underpinning it, which means there's no restriction on printing cash. And the other was in the, was it the early 90s, I think it was, where you suddenly had mortgages that were no longer connected yeah. in any way with your ability to pay for them. Yeah. You know, and that, that was Self-certified, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was just crazy. You know, you could go in. And I, I had it when I was buying a property. And it's like, well, um, how much of a mortgage would you look? Oh, it's right. It's like, what, what um, property value are you thinking of? Well, that, yeah. well, that depends upon how much of a mortgage I can afford. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you, well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, because you're not going to be paid yeah. for it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, uh, but times change, and and yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the biggest downsides is the obscene amount of cash that goes around in the financial services industries and the way that the people spend it and behave. Yeah, at the disadvantage of everybody else, we're in the Cotswolds, and you cannot rent a property now. I mean, the, the people in the city get interest-free loans to buy whatever they want. Yep. And so all the local people suffer. Um, well, it, you, 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 see, you see that all over where it's like um, a ripple effect where I think a lot of people as well, they've moved out of London. And because the nature is that property prices in London are still quite high. So e even if you had a one-bedroom flat in London, you know, that, that's going to get you five, eight hundred thousand pounds, which then allows you to buy something out where I live, um, which then means the person who lives where I live at the moment will sell up and they'll move a bit further out and a bit further out. And, and this is where you get this whole ripple effect into like, you know, Buckinghamshire initially, mm -hmm. then Shropshire and um, the Cotswolds, as you say. Well, no, because people are working maybe three days a week from home, that band of uh, commuting uh, distance is spreading and spreading so yep it's uh yeah we're going to have to move to cornwall soon <laughs> <laughs> and then the cornish people are all going to be saying well we can't afford to live here yes. anymore. yep yeah. uh, I, I think that's the thing though it, it just cascades out and then maybe just go cyclic maybe all of a sudden the only place you can afford to live is in the center of london <laughs> yes. it, it, it kind of goes around in circles now so yeah, well they've got to do something with the shops because nobody wants them so yeah. they might as well live in them. Well, well that, I think you're right. That, that's another thing, that they will start converting um, offices and shops into accommodation. And, the, and they're always saying we've got an accommodation shortage. So I, th I think that's um, pretty likely. Yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. Oh. Hey, we're Not joined good. by Hussain. Hey there. Hello, Gary. How are you? Hey, good, thanks. Meet uh, Chris. Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi Delighted to, to make you. your acquaintance. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you. We, we've only got a couple of us on. I, I threw on the message in the, the crypto group at the last minute, thinking yeah. maybe some people want to join. Because um, I've been running these events physically for right. several years uh, in my local town. And then with COVID and that, I kind of transferred them online. So we, do, we just meet up every week and we just chat about whatever's happening, really. Excellent. I, I watched one of your um, videos on YouTube the other day. and I, It was brilliant. Really good conversation. And I thought, yeah, the good crowd there as well. So delighted that you're advertising these on UK Crypto. So oh, hopefully good. we can get a few more people to join. I'll definitely yeah. bang the drum. Well, I'd, I'd be happy if you don't mind me promoting it through that. Yeah. I'm always cautious. I don't want to over promote anything in any other group because I run a few groups myself mm. and I'm all about growing ecosystems and communities, which is great, but not taking advantage. I mean, go ahead. Honestly, I don't mind what serve. The more posts we, I'm trying to encourage more people to post into the group anyway, because it, it's mostly me at the moment. So okay. please, yeah, take advantage. <laughs> it's fine. So how, how does it, how's the world of Ziggler in there? Uh, brilliant. So we've had, it's been a hell of a quarter, right? Um, we've listed Tezos, but more importantly, we've automated the mechanism for listing assets. So you're going to see a whole bunch of assets, maybe one every couple of weeks. Okay. Um, no technical difficulty in listing new assets that are available, at least on Coinbase Prime in GBP, in, in Sterling. They're the quickest ones that we can list. But I think the big news is 
uh, Bitcoin Boost, our yield product for Bitcoin, um, which is 5% uh, interest APY, I believe is uh, yeah, yearly, but it's calculated by the second and paid every Saturday. Um, and there'll be more there. So uh, I don't mind telling you guys, but please keep it secret. So, wow. okay. so, so don't worry, oh, yeah. where, is, where, where is all this based and with whom? So um, I'm the chief tech, Chris, I'm the chief technology officer at Zigloo. We're a UK based regulated entity by the FCA. We have an electronic money license and a five MLD crypto asset business license as well. Um, we launched to the general public in 2020, and it's a mobile app that provides a custodial wallet. Not non, it's not non-custodial, so it's you don't have your keys. That's the it, an important thing to remember because it's it's really targeted at crypto beginners, and the whole kind of the shenanigans that you have to go through with managing your own keys. At least at this stage, we decided we'll just provide a custodial wallet and put convenience over custody um, in the first instance for rolling out Siglu. However, I am every day kind of, again, banging the drum around non-custodial wallet services, and we're talking to Fireblocks around providing something like that. It's just that we have so many other things on the roadmap right now, um, juggling between a, a limited number of resources and so many options is a, is a bit difficult. But you can download this for iOS and Android from the App Store or Play Store. It's a mobile only proposition. And you should be able to onboard quite easily. We do KYC and AML um, in the same way as most of the challenger banks do it um, through the mobile app. And then you have the ability to buy, hold, sell, save, and spend crypto um, and fiat currencies all in one place. We provide a, what looks like a current account. It isn't a current account, but it's an EMI equivalent. You have an, a sort code and an account number and you can use faster payments to transfer fiat in, into Sorry, and what, out of your wallet. What, what's the name of the app again? Ziglu. Let me write it down for you um, in here. Well, Z-I-G-L-U. Yeah, so I'll stick it in the chat. Okay. You, you just go to the website, ziglu.com, isn't it? Yeah, ziglu.io. Oh, it's in the Ziglu.io. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah, our customer numbers are growing pretty well at the moment, and um, we, we're getting a, the marketing machine is now ramping up. Finally, we haven't really done any marketing at the moment, and we've got about fifteen thousand customers through just through our Cedars crowdfunding round and um, word of mouth, really. Okay. And I've been running UK crypto on Facebook almost as a joke, but now it's got one point <laughs> one thousand seven hundred people on it. It's actually taking time. Um, but that, that's the safe, scammer-free place to discuss all things crypto. I'm, I'm quite brutal in terms of the policy I have in terms of, with respect to moderating the group. So, you know, no promotions, no scams. You get booted instantly if we um, find out you've been breaking the rules. Well, it's a, it's a good group, that, as well, because you can see how there's some really good basic questions being asked. Yes. Which, which is great, because that's what I love about helping communities and ma making sure they don't get caught out in that. But I also find it quite disturbing at times, some of the answers right. from the people who claim to know what they're talking about. Yeah. But you look at the answer and you go, it doesn't work that way. It, it's nuts, isn't it? I mean, it, the more information we can get to the general public, the better. And, and it's the, it's a fine line between being overly authoritative. And sometimes people, I think they aren't, they're not answering maliciously. I oh, hope, yeah. I, yeah. I think it generally is ignorance. Right. But, um, but yeah, there's the odd malicious one in there that we have to weed out as well. So. Yeah. But, but I, I see it in other groups as well. Right. And like um, I was involved in a, a, a group where that, that actually invited me is um, a, a, a private investors group. And so that they actually that they've met up for years. They used to go to a hotel every month or whatever and talk about investing in property and shares and that. And they extended it to crypto. And I, I did a talk or a, a, a webinar, sorry, a, a panel type thing, talking about ICOs. So you did the whole investment thing a couple of years ago. And this was at Heathrow about three, four years ago now. And someone came up to me afterwards. And they said, oh, wow, we didn't, we didn't realize that's how ICOs work, that actually 
you've got no rights and they're just tokens, they're meaningless and that. Uh, wish I'd known about that before I put a lot of money into them. Ouch. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. I, I know. And um, I'm still involved in a couple of the groups since then. I'm still seeing the conversation. Someone was posting something the other day about, oh, well, um, I, I've put a load of crypto currency into something and I'd like to exit early. How do I go about it? And you go, oh, interesting. How have they locked your cryptocurrency? Oh, well, it's a project that I put some cash into and they're creating this token that they promised they'll... Oh, it's an ICO then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, wow. uh, and these are people who are, in theory, sophisticated investors who have done their due diligence, or rather they haven't. Someone's shown them a graph, and the graph's gone, wee, and yeah. gone, we'll have some of that. <laughs> There are very few people who do their own due diligence. It's a rare thing. And actually, I think culturally, it's really interesting what's happening, at least in the UK and the broader crypto community, where you are seeing ordinary people who kind of lost faith in and or realize at least that they can't trust anyone. And yep. You've got to do the work yourself or at least find trusted sources to take some of the effort away. Yep. And I, th I think if you become a trusted source in the next 10 years, you yeah, you'll have a big following, and uh, but it's maintaining trust because of the financial legacy financial sector is more or less betrayed most people's trust. Well, let's, let's face it; you know, they do the surveys each year of which professions are the least trusted, right? Uh, and it kind of cycles <laughs> through. You know, it was the press at one point, MPs at another point, but generally the lowest of the low are usually bankers and insurers. And I, and I find it fascinating because I, I spend a lot of my time in the insurance sector and I know that they genuinely mean well. That they, mm. they, They're not a load of people who are just trying to rip you off, that they genuinely are trying to do things. But the way insurance works, it just looks like you're getting ripped off now. And so they, they feel really bad. But bankers, you know, Chris and I were chatting about this before about how bankers just skim off their amounts anyway. They, they can never lose. So when you look at it, we don't trust lawyers, we don't trust bankers, we don't trust insurers. Who do we trust this day and age? And the bizarre thing is we seem to trust Facebook, and yet we don't. You know, so right. you think about how much information people are sharing in Facebook these days, um, whilst also saying they don't trust Facebook in the slightest. Um, and this is where I think challenger banks are in with a good chance, because if you don't trust anybody, well, you might as well not trust anyone who at least charges you less. Right. You know, I, I had it the other day. I, I had two letters, one from my bank to say that the interest rate on a deposit account was now 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. It's, it's a Satoshi. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and another letter from a credit card company to just say, oh, the interest rate's now 35%. And, right. <laughs> and it's like, so hang on. So if I put on deposit, I get zero, but I need to borrow it. I pay 35%. <laughs> it's like, God. Unbelievable. The disparity, right? How, how do you reconcile that? And, and this is, most people aren't savvy enough. I mean, I, I'm, I've, I've started looking at decentralized um, finance now in, in anger like, or in earnest, whichever one you want to use. But I'm finding providers that, I'm trying to get my head around how is this safe? And I finally realized that it's, everything is over collateralized yeah. and you've got to look at the smart contract or whatever the blockchain technology is. And it actually looks pretty damn safe. I mean, that, that of course, there's a million scams out there as well. But I found a few that I like really high rates. You have full control over the, your loaning to, to, to these organizations. You post your loan. They basically say hoddle hoddle is the one that I've been looking at recently. And it's like their whole gambit is that we just provide the tools. We're not giving you any financial information or advice or any. It, these are the tools. If you like the platform, create your own loan or sort out your own borrowing, find your own facility and work it out yourself. But And they only arbitrate in the case of a dispute. And it's mm -hmm. really clever how they do that. They've got three, essentially it's three keys. Um, and, and the equivalent of it's a multi-segwit uh, um, escrow account. I still haven't worked out the technical details, but that's what I'm looking forward to doing in the next few days and just make sure for myself that it all works. I mean, yeah. my only problem with them is uh, that because they have low volumes at the moment, they can deal with the very few cases of arbitration that they get involved in, mostly the 
counterparties could sort out the disputes between themselves. But if they get really popular, you one would expect that there'll be more cases of arbitration required than this. Just how do you deal with that? Yep. It's a minor point, really. Um, and yeah, the disparity in yields is shocking. Um, I mean, how the hell do cre uh, credit card companies get away with it? It's yep. unbelievable. Well, that, all, all that's going to happen is that yeah, you'll see that margin narrow as availability improves. So, you know, the great thing about technology is it improves everyone's access to things. And it's only when you become aware of these differences of, you know, the, the arbitration points, then people weigh in. And that's when, you know, the, the margins narrow and, you know, the bid offer spread decreases or whatever. So I think you're right on that. So what are you seeing, I guess, both of you, Chris and Gary, what, how, like, in terms of people learning more about this stuff, what is, it, what is your feeling? Like, is, that, is it gaining adoption? Is it gaining traction? Or is it still an arcane kind of area of finance that only experts know how to deal with? My, my impression is that more and more people are becoming aware of it. The start of it. So you look at the surveys, most people in the UK, for example, now know of cryptocurrency. They may not own it, but at least they've heard of it. Um, and a smaller amount. I've, I did quote some numbers the other day in Money Magpie's interview about what percentage of the UK now own crypto in some way. And it, it might be as high as 5% or something, which wow. I, I was surprised by it was that high kind of thing. Um, so I think it is growing. But, you know, Chris is probably going to give a better perspective on how do you learn about this stuff and how do you find out about it? You're a bit newer to this, aren't you, Chris? Well, I, yeah, I mean, I've been in business all my life. I've had two professional careers, but I've run businesses and owned businesses outside that. Fortunately, more successful ones than failures, but uh, a number of really good failures. And so I've always been looking and uh, in some ways been ahead of the, tried to be, be ahead of the, trend. Mm -hmm. I feel that, that uh, people look on crypto in much the same way that they look at multi-level marketing. It's something they laugh at mm -hmm. rather than understand. And um, they, they, they assume everything's a Ponzi scheme and it's going to go bang rather than look into it. I think if you take the uh, attitude that you're prepared to do some research, it would be foolish not to become involved in the growth of certainly blockchain and in my book cryptocurrencies because they're going to have a major value in the future how are you finding it from an education point of view but because i know you've asked oh, people me don't pe people don't want to know hmm. that they're, they're too busy you know and i don't have the time and um, they go to a financial advisor rather than do the work themselves and i think that's one of the aspects of financial advice that has is becoming less reputable and so people are going to have to consider uh, themselves and of course having having more time at home um, they have more chance to do some research in their own behalf rather than doing what everybody's tell been told telling them to do in an office but i don't well what's your background hussein um so what how far would you want me to go back <laughs> <laughs> well i think we can all do that <laughs> yeah. let me start professionally so um i got into technology during the dot-com era and done a couple of successful dot-coms and some dot-bombs as a developer so i was writing code at the time uh, then i kind of switched slightly and went, went to work for backs a bankers automated clearing system and spent six years there where I finally ended up doing um, the, all of the middleware infrastructure for FPS. So I was the authority for FPS middleware. And that's where I really cut my teeth on payments in the UK retail sector and the technology transactional systems, those things. From there, I went to Deutsche Bank for six years. And that was uh, front, middle and back office applications, um, most of the bank running on our what was platform as a service, essentially, in, in the bank. And I finished there on the front desk doing um, on the equity front desk with a market mating, making application um, for my sins. They actually let me do that for six months before I left, which and I wanted to learn. I really just wanted to really have of like firsthand experience of cutting code into yeah. a, a market making app. And then finally decided, well, 
uh, got approached by founders in Hong Kong for U-Trip, which if you want to be unkind, is an Asian clone of Revolut. Um, that's doing really well in Singapore at the moment. I, I took a CTO role there and, and got them set up. I was only there for seven months, unfortunately, because one of the things that the founders didn't realize at the time is you need bin sponsorship to have to run a card product. And there are, you know, it's an FX, multi FX wallet currency card and mobile app. And their bin sponsor was EasyLink, which is the equivalent of Octopus here, the mass transit provider. Mm. Great bin sponsor to have. Like that, that's a business there. You may not be a unicorn, but you'll definitely have a com comfortable business when your bin sponsor is a mass transit provider. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a 12 month tendering process to get oh, the wow. bins to get the bin sponsorship from them and they were telling us all the way through it it's like you know we you know, you've won it we just have to go through the motions of doing this thing but that's why I left I kind of set up the team but we couldn't take it any further until the bin sponsorship was put in place and I, there's nothing for me to do essentially they got it to the point that I could and and they had to just get the bin sponsorship then I went to Burma, I guess, Myanmar, um, working for Wave Money. And that was uh, horrific in many ways, but it's uh, also a very good experience. Um, we were insourcing our IT from the evil clutches of Telenor Myanmar and Wipro. So the, the board of um, Wave Money had realized that the business is burning down when they've outsourced their core mobile banking platform. They need to bring this in-house and put it on a virtual cloud essentially so i managed to do that for them you know build up the team and kind of run that until we were doing a, about fifteen thousand transactions in a, in a peak uh hour which was five times more than when i arrived and, and the system's humming quite nicely and then finally got back to london met up with mark hipperson who's the cto and co-founder of starling bank he told me he wanted to bring uh challenger banking ethos to the crypto sector and you know i've been in bitcoin since the end of 2009 but i'm, I'm really not a, i'm not a bitcoin billionaire unfortunately this time around i might be a multi-millionaire but yeah. <laughs> i've got a few good bets but um but but yeah i thought this is great i i want to be in the crypto sector and mark is credible he actually gave me some advice before I went to Hong Kong, which was incredibly useful um, at the time. So I've been with Ziglu now for the last two years. So pr pr pretty confidence, pretty strong background there as well. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm enjoying it. It's good. It's good to be in London. I think we're in the, the right place. As it, whenever I'm hiring anyone at Ziglu, one of my key lines is you realize that this is a opportunity of a lifetime for these reasons. Number one, you're in London and you're not in the States with the SEC kicking, kicking every flipping, or putting uncertainty and doubt into the crypto sector. The regulator here is really, you know, the FCA have been pretty damn supportive. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we met with Tom Mutton um, from the Bank of England. He's the fintech director of the Bank of England. Really good guy asking some really incisive questions around what we're doing and how we're doing it. I was surprised at how well informed he is about what we're doing. So we're in London. That's a big, big plus. Number two, you're in the, the next decade is when if you can characterize crypto as enthusiasts, cryptophiles and criminals, um, <laughs> essentially driving up the market cap. This next decade is when it turns into a real asset class. It's mm. institutional investors, private equity, family offices, publicly listed companies. So it, it is an asset class now. And then you look at the market cap, which is two trillion now. Who would have thought in like six to nine months from 500 billion to two trillion? And I think it will go up to five um, over the course of the next decade. Who knows? It might even replace gold to some extent, maybe eat some of gold's 10 trillion but over the next decade you have a new asset class something that only happens once in a lifetime frankly you're in london and if you're working for ziglu you're working in a cloud native organization that's a kind of challenger bank in its dna and, and a fintech through and through so that's my normal pitch whenever i try and hire someone into ziglu and it normally works so i think people understand that it is a once in a lifetime opportunity well, uh, I, I always um, publish these videos after the events. 
So I'll edit out the bit that you say, don't tell anyone about this. <laughs> no, I mean, just go ahead. That's fine. I think, but, but I, th I think it's important that people, I, I think the most important thing that we can be helpful and, and hopefully promoting the fact that they've got to take charge of their own finances. Yep. Yeah. And if but, they're going to do that, then there is help out there to guide them. I think the other thing as well is that we're now at the point where on my on my mobile phone, you know, I've, I've got a banking app and actually it's just moving numbers. And whether those numbers are pounds with my local bank accounts or dollars through Revolut or Bitcoin through Ziglu <laughs> or, or whatever type thing, doesn't really make any difference, does it? It's just numbers going up and down now. And so the, the user experience, this is why I keep saying whenever people talk about what want to do blockchain courses and they say, I'm really looking forward to understanding about blockchain, and how it works. It, no, no, no. If, if you're still interested in blockchain after what I teach you, then I, I've missed the point. You should just get on with using it and not worry about it. And it's the same with crypto in some ways that if we can make the user experience such that people don't even realize what it is that they're using, and they just use it to make payments, Yeah. then it doesn't matter yeah. whether it's in pounds, dollars, euros, or Bitcoin, or Litecoin, or wherever. That's exactly our ethos and Mark's vision as well, right? So, um, you know, f f crypto fiat parity, you cannot tell the difference. The, the only thing you should be thinking about is, possibly the only thing you should be thinking about is the fact that Litecoin went up 20%, and maybe you want to use that to purchase something instead of um, something that's gone down in value. Yep. And e even there, we could probably come up with a suggestion to say, hey, do you want to, you want to use like your Litecoin account for this particular purchase? I mean, today, or is it yesterday, actually, uh, someone had done a little video of, of our card and, and how it works. And they said it's one of the few cards that you can spend crypto with. Now, that's technically not correct. We, we settle in fiat with our card. It's a MasterCard debit card. But actually, he hit the nail on the head that it's, it's so easy for me to just sell 20 pounds of Litecoin using the app, put that into my Sterling account and then spend it. That I, I don't think about it. Hmm. Now, so for some people, there is that hurdle. And there's just one more yeah. user piece of user experience to just say, well, today I want to spend Litecoin on, for, on this transaction. But it's so quick to actually, and easy to use Zigloo to do that, that I, I don't think about it. I've, I've done this a couple of times, especially with Litecoin since it's pumped quite recently in Tezos. Now, if something pumps 20%, I just bag a little bit into um, my Sterling wallet and do my shopping out of it. I mean, this is the whole thing that, you know, my, my vision is that it'll just get easier and easier to use. So no, no more of this copy and pasting this public key and... Right all this kind of stuff. It's like, come on, we are in the 21st century now. And the thing that's going to lead to adoption is a blend of usability and regulation. You know, and I always say the thing about regulation, I support what you say about the FCA, is that it's a matter of having appropriate regulation where you don't want it to be overbearing. And I think the FCA has got the balance right, but you don't want it where people lose money. So it, it needs to be sufficient that it's a safe environment, which is attractive. And that's, again, I, I agree with you about the London point, that you've got the, the banking system, whatever, it's got the heritage in there, but you've got a regulator who's quite switched on with this stuff as well uh, and has got a pretty good reputation globally. Yeah. Uh, did, did you get involved in the, um, the FCA's innovation sandboxes at all? No, a bit before my time, to be honest. Um, and it's something that we've considered getting involved in. We've had this conversation, haven't we, actually? And maybe for the crypto, for the crypto side, maybe, yeah. Um, but, but no, not uh, uh, until now, no, we haven't done that. Okay, because the, the, they've kind of rebranded re or relaunched it a little bit. I think it's now a digital innovation sandbox. Right. But it's still, it's still the same principle. And when you look at what they did with the sandbox of allowing companies to push the boundaries... At about the same time as the Monetary Authority of Singapore did the same, mm. and HKMA, Hong Kong one, did the yeah. same. They're all kind of following this model. And I think it's good that the FCA is using it as a way of learning about this stuff as well. So it's pretty neat on that. Guys, just conscious that yeah. time suddenly flew there. I think we're chatting away quite nicely, and then all of a sudden, just like technology, things go faster and faster. 
So we usually finish at six, six o'clock. Oh, we're very much at six on the dot. So I'll say to both of you, th thanks for coming along today. Shame the word. Thank you. People. Um, but yeah. <coughs> um, Thank you, Gary. A, a pleasure as always. But I'll, I'll stick it on a couple of groups again next week and we'll try and build this up a bit more. Uh, because I think it's just useful to chat through some of these things about what we're hearing in the news, things like you, know, you were posting about Ripple uh, and the SEC and all this kind of stuff. Be good to explore that a little bit more next week to see what it actually means for people. So, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. guys, th thanks for coming along. Thanks for coming in. And, uh, to meet you, Chris, and thank you, Gary. But a pleasure. Have good. a good one, folks. <laughs> Bye good now. Good to see Bye. you again. Many yeah. thanks. Bye. Bye.